Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of Isaiah. We are now in chapter 31, and this is a relatively short chapter. So we'll spend a little bit more time because it has some very pertinent translation issues as well as things that we should pay attention when we learn more about God. It begins very similar to chapter 30 regarding people who trusted in Egypt, and it continues that woe. So in the last couple of chapters, we have seen this word woe, which in the Hebrew is hoy. It's an exclamation, an interjection, a disappointment. Right? So I just put here a, a, more of an exclamation of a disappointment. And this is pronounced by God himself. He, he is looking at the Israelites, and in this case, particularly uh, Judah. And so those who go down to Egypt uh, is also at a time where we find that we find two periods of time, those who go down to Egypt. This is with regards to Assyria who comes against the northern kingdom of Israel, and then later on against the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, please bear this in mind. And so we find in, I guess, in, in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 17 and in verse 4, this would be Hosea. King Hosea went to Egypt and sought out so the Pharaoh. And we are told in the previous chapter, perhaps even Judah eventually did the same, but we're not told in the in the scriptures itself. But God is taking, I guess um, you could say, God is taking a, 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 an exception about this particular action, about going down to Egypt for help. Now, the idea of help here, uh, really for assistance, it would be for aid, you could say that, it is not so much for deliverance. Uh, so let me just break this down. Going down would be the geographical uh, understanding. So Canaan is higher up. So we have Canaan and then Egypt. And so they would be always going down to Egypt and going up to Canaan. So that's how we would understand these geographical trajectories. Now, Egypt was a world power, even at the time when the Assyrians came against Israel and then later against Judah, Egypt was always there. Egypt has always been a world power for a long time. And so God is taking exception to those who go down to Egypt to seek help. And these are the ones who rely on Horses. Now, one of the interesting things about horses, and of course here, chariots, because horses are always used in battle. And Egypt has many, many horses. And Egypt has many, many chariots. And Egypt has many, many horsemen who are very strong. So many chariots, very strong horsemen, and relying on the implements of battle and to look at Egypt to help them, equip them, uh, even providing uh, army assistance to, to confront Assyria. 
Now, that would be the picture that's being painted right here. God is saying, woe to you. When you go down to Egypt and you seek them for help, you rely on the implements of war. Now, there's nothing wrong with relying them, uh, relying on implements of war. But the fact that the very intent was not looking at God. And so that would be the exception that God is taking. God is saying, you are not looking to the Holy One of Israel. You are not seeking Jehovah. Now, this needs a bit of explanation. Do not look to. Now, this word look is regard. You can, you can check out Egypt, uh, um, Edom or, or Moab, all the other nations that are around you. But you never considered the Holy One of Israel. Although Israel is that nation right here, the Holy One of Israel actually focuses on the idea of special. Jehovah is that special one of Israel. What makes Israel different from other nations is what God has given to them. And who is this God? Jehovah. And so we are seeing that this would be an A and this would be a B. They are both talking about the same thing. They are looking towards someone else, some place else, some other nation for assistance, but they have not even considered God, the special one, the one that made Israel holy. Now, remember, the word holy is special. The most special one of Israel is Jehovah God. And he is the one who made Israel a holy nation. They did not even seek. Now, the idea of seek here is to inquire. They didn't even ask of God. Right? They didn't ask of God. Which means this, that the position of God in the eyes of the nation has been so relegated that they had virtually forgotten God. Now, this is the complaint. This is the disappointment, the hoy that is stated here against Israel and perhaps against Judah later on, which is stated in chapter 30. And so this is the first part, and, and this first part would introduce the entire chapter. It is all about the fact that Israel is not considering God. Israel is not asking of God. Israel didn't even begin thinking of God. So if one does not think of God, one will not rely on God. One would not seek God for help. And that is the problem that this prophecy is addressing. We go on to verse 2. It says, God himself is wise. Now, the idea of wise, uh, hakam, is the fact that God knows what he is doing and he will bring disaster. Now, understand many a times English words don't give us a good meaning. This word is ra and it means evil. And so God will bring evil upon Israel. Now understand that I've often told us that evil is always seen in the eyes of the beholder. That means good is also the same. So when you say that evil, God says he's going to do evil, it is not evil in the eyes of God, but it's evil in the eyes of Israel. He will bring 
evil in Israel's eyes. He's going to do something that Israel will not like. He will do something that Israel will consider not what they are expecting. And this is the wise actions of God. And we are told that God will not call back his words. Now, the idea of call back, this would be retract or set aside. Basically, God has given his words. He has said that he will punish Israel. And in this case, God, unlike what he did in Nidiveh, he is not doing it here. Why? Because they deserve to be punished. They ignored God for the longest time. And so God says that he will rise up against the house of evildoers, against the help of all those who work in iniquity. And so those who give aid, God is also having problems with. They look for help, but those who give help, God is going to teach them a lesson as well. And so the idea here is God is fixated in his wise course of action. Now, his wise course of action is not liked by Israel. It is not liked by those who are doing evil. So this word evildoers are the people who does evil against others in the nation of Israel. That was the very reason God is punishing them because of, uh, 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 of the evil works uh, of oppression to the uh, the poor, the needy, uh, of doing violence, uh, and, and all of these things God has been warning them, sending uh, prophets after prophets, but they did not repent. So God says, I will do that, and I will also act against those whom you have gone to seek help. The course of action that God has done is going to carry through. Now, God explains one thing. You are going down to Egypt, but the Egyptians are men. Now, this word men is Adam. Loosely translated, it would be humans. Humankind. And not God. Now, I guess you can say that the word here is El. Right, L. Not the God kind. They are not powerful like God. They are merely mortals. They are humans. They are not God or L himself, right? Their horses are flesh, and their horses is not spirit. Now, this word spirit is wind. So the idea here is a comparison. These are contrasts, an A and a B. The idea here is that men versus God. Flesh versus spirit. Now what does that mean? One can die, one can't. One has power over the mortal. One has no power over the spirit world. They are two very, very different contrasts. In fact, you can't even compare the two because they, they are two very different things. It's like comparing apples and oranges. And that is how God is saying the Egyptians and God and the Egyptians' implements and the angelic world, you can say that the spirit world or spirit beings would be the angels 
are two very different types. Uh, and, and one has power, one doesn't. Man has no power, God has. Flesh has no power, but the spirit has. And the spirit or spirit beings have. Now, this word here tells us that this would be the contrast of powers over the body. And when God stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall, he who is helped will fall down, and they will all perish together. Now, we need to just look at this. First of all, God stretches out his hands would be take action. When God takes action, it is using the proverbial body parts. Uh, and this would be the hand. Hand is seen as an action part where it is to strike at something. And so the action here is to strike at them. So both who helps, which is the Egyptians, and he who is helped, which is the Israelites, both will fall. Now the idea of fall, the first word is to stumble and stumble to fall. And the second word is to literally fall down flat. Basically telling us they will be of no contest. They will be, they will perish together. Now, this word perish together, the word perish here is to seize. They will end together. They will be finished together. Which tells us when God intends to work, there's nothing that man can actually do to do anything against what God has set in place. That, that's basically uh, what we are told. So God is a God who had, once he has decided that he will carry out, nothing is going to stop that. Uh, that in itself is very important to see because God is God. And when he takes action, he takes action. Now, the, the only reason why there's a difference here versus, let's say, um, in the case of, the, of Jonah in Nineveh, is that the people in Nineveh abandoned their evil deeds. The people here in Israel did not. And hence, God carried out his punishment. Verse 4. Again, these are some of the words being used so that we can tell that God actually spoke these words. So thus says the Lord to me. Uh, that is basically what it says. When, when thus says the Lord, please be mindful that this is a very serious note. Very important because it is describing the speech of God. And the speech of God, in this case, is spoken to Isaiah. And now it's conveyed to the readers in this compilation of prophecies. So let us understand the pictures. Now understand this. Much of Isaiah's prophecies are described in poetic language. And we begin in the poetic language as the poetic language describes an illustration. The illustration is about a lion roaring and a young lion over his prey. Now this should be seen as an A and a B. It is a lion, and this is a lion over the prey. So you find that when a lion has a prey, the lion is always safeguarding the prey. This is a picture of the lion. So the idea is about the lion. 
And God is spoken as a lion. This is God speaking as a lion roars because he has found a prey. A young lion over his prey stands over it and tells everyone, this is mine. Now, in, in the description that follows, that says, if we paint this scenario, when many shepherds come against him, what does that mean? Uh, it means that when, when shepherds are all watching their sheep and their, their goats, and if a lion comes after one of the animals, the shepherds will gather together to, uh, to, to distract the animal, distract the lion from the prey so that he might be able to let go of the animal and the shepherds will go and rescue the, the animal. But the description here is that the young lion will not be afraid of their voice nor be disturbed by their noise. It means that the lion will not be distracted. So it doesn't matter what comes. And so the passage here continues to say, So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. Now, this is a picture. The picture of God descending to fight, to protect, and to deliver. So understand this, Yehovah Zavaot. In the same way when God is watching over Israel, God will not allow the Assyrians, the Egyptians, or whoever else distracts his focus. And so this word come down means to descend. To descend from above. So it's giving us a picture that God will come down from above to fight for Israel, Mount Zion, and its hill. The and we'll come back to this. And it says, again, like birds flying about. You know, all these um, birds that is looking at uh, a, a prey uh, below, circling. So will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver. Passing over, he will preserve it. Now, all both of these are I guess you could say um, a picture that describes God's focus to protect, defend, preserve, and deliver Jerusalem. Jerusalem being uh, Judah. So now we're talking about Judah. And it says that God will do something, God will not allow Jerusalem at this time, to be taken away. So like birds flying about. So if you have an animal, and then the birds are flying all over, they are circling, right? They are circling in the sky. And it's watching that this animal is not going to be taken away. So that's the picture that God, so will God, the Lord of hosts. The idea here is to defend Right to defend Israel, and so the I the word here defend uh, is to hedge, hedge to protect. And as God hedges, He will also deliver, cause her. To be rescued. And then it says here that he will pasach, this word passing over, hop over. This is the same idea as 
the uh, Pesach, the Passover, that God will hop over uh, Israel and he will preserve Israel. And this word preserve is to let slip away. Let her escape. Now think of this picture. Eventually, we see that this would be the Assyrians coming after Jerusalem, besieging it and circling it, all 185,000 soldiers. It is literally a doomsday battle. And yet God is saying, I will not let that happen to Jerusalem. So don't think of the Egyptians. Don't think of Egypt. Don't think of anyone else. Think of God. And God will not let this happen to Jerusalem. God will come down. And we see this coming down in the form of the angel. That overnight, the angel of the Lord destroyed all 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrians. God will be focused to defend, to protect, hedge around Jerusalem. That's a very important idea. While the soldiers are around Jerusalem, God is also around Jerusalem, protecting her. And will hop over, meaning the angel of the Lord, will not get into Jerusalem to destroy her, but will hop over Jerusalem, right? To hop over Jerusalem to destroy the Assyrians. And in hopping over, in in doing the pas, uh, in 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 doing the pasak, right? Uh, God will allow Jerusalem to escape the doom of the Assyrians. Now that would be the picture in verses four and five. We come to verse six. Verse six begins an appeal. The appeal is this: return. Return to him against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. This is what God has always wanted in punishing his children. It is to call them to repent. And this is the word shuv. To return to the original state where Israel was good with God. So return to him. Him would be whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. Now, deeply revolted, uh, how should we say? Uh, profoundly turn away profoundly, this would be profoundly, profoundly uh, turn away. Not just turn away. So there is an adjective there called deeply revolted. This is what deeply is. It's really unbelievable that these people have gone so far away from God. And that's, that's the picture in verse 6. For in that day, now, every time you see in that day, that would be the future day. Every man shall throw away his idols of silver, his idols of gold. And this is called, um, and, and well, I guess we have to retranslate it, which your own hands have made for yourselves, and I think we could move this to the back, and it is a sin. So to understand this, the only way of repentance, only way of repentance, and this says here, to throw away. The idea of throw away is to reject, 
to refuse and to cause to disappear. Now the word idols here, uh, I guess you could say uh, things that is vain, it has no value uh, that they have considered as God, made of silver and made of gold, that they made with their own hands. And this is considered an offense to God. It is also an offense that is punishable by God. And he will do just that. And always, I guess, as I mentioned many times, when God punishes, the intent is to get them to repent, not to enjoy inflicting pain and suffering to the people. This is the divine justice that God has on his people. It is to drive them to repent from all the offenses they have done against God for which God is punishing them. Now, as we come to the end of this chapter, it now tells us about Assyria. It says, and then uh, Assyria shall fall by a sword not of man. Now, this is interesting. Uh, a sword not of mankind shall devour him or consume him. This word is consume. What do you mean uh, a sword not of man, not of a man, not of humans, not of uh not of humans, okay? Which tells us if it's not human, then it is divine. It is a spirit-like. And of course, we are told the 185,000 uh, army of the Assyrians died not by the sword of Jerusalem, but by the sword of the angel of the Lord. And Assyria shall flee from this sword. His young man shall become forced labor. They would lose and they become slaves. He shall cross over to his stronghold for fear. Now verse 9 needs a bit of a translation. So this word is not he shall uh, cross over to his stronghold. Uh, this word is, let me just put it here. His rock will pass away in terror. So this one we will strike out. It should be his rock. And this, this word, his rock, would be the Assyrians. Right? This would be the Assyrians. The Assyrians' place of... Uh, the Assyrians' rock. Now, understand the word rock. In the, in the place of the Middle East, in the place where Israel is, a rock is not like how we see ourselves. You know, uh, uh, the, the big rock that we see nowadays is like a boulder. The rock in that part of the land is actually the hill or the mountain. It is one rock. It is really one rock that is standing out of the landscape. It is not many pieces of rock. It's one rock. And so whenever you think of rock, don't think of a little piece of stone, but look at the landscape of, of Israel. 
that the hills of Israel is considered a rock, and that's where people will go for safety. So Assyria's safety will pass away in terror, and his princes shall be afraid of the banner. Now, this word is a problem. So let's understand this. They will be terrified. I guess the word terrified shall be afraid would be be dismayed. Be dismayed, be shattered. Not just afraid, be shattered, be broken. Now, for a 185,000 strong army of Assyria, the generals and captains will be completely thrown out of their... Their, their, their shoes or their boots or whatever, the sandals, you can call it. And this word is not banner. This word here should be seen as um, the miracle. The miracle, uh, the sign that God has taken action against the Assyrians. And this sign is so incredible because 185,000 were slaughtered, that the captains of that army wouldn't know what to do. They are completely destroyed in their morale. And then it says here, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Again, this is something that you can call an A and a B. Jerusalem and Zion are both talking about the same thing. Fire and furnace is talking about the same thing. Uh, and this would literally be a place where they are cooked, right? They are consumed. Consumed. Cooked by fire. And so God is saying that God is using Zion and Jerusalem and is providing the word. And the word of God, this word says, uh, I guess we could say, this word says is the, 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 the word or the declaration. This is the declaration of God. Uh, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem, that God will be there to protect his people. And the Assyrians would not know what hit them. Right over the night, 185,000 would have been destroyed. The princes, as it's stated here, shall be completely shattered because God has acted. And so, Chapter 9 really tells us something quite interesting, that Israel should not depend on the Egyptians. They should not depend on others because they are part and parcel of the holy nation of uh, Jehovah. And so Jehovah is the special one of Israel who will protect them. But the dismay, the disappointment in Chapter 31 is that they have forgotten God. They have ignored God. They have completely lost sight of God. And so God sends this as a punishment and God is not going to change his mind. Why? Because God has set forth that these people has not repented. And so the intent of the punishment is to drive them to repentance. And the prophecy tells us that in due time, they did. The appeal is to tell them to repent, to throw away, right? To repent, throw away, cause all the idols to disappear, whatever they have made. And that was the reason why God is destroying them and, and punishing them. Remove the reason for the punishment and they will be fine. And God will demonstrate his power over the Assyrians that you don't need Egypt. You don't need the horses. You need God. That in itself is a challenge to Israel and Judah 
as a prophecy to tell them, do not forget God. Israel is a special place, a special nation, a holy nation. And God is that special one of Israel. And so God will take care of his own. Now, as a nation, that is what they are expected to do. But in the course of history, as we're told, they forgot God. They dealt with sin. They dealt with idolatry. They dealt with Hamas, violence against the poor, the needy. And chapter 31 is a prophecy to remind Israel and Judah who God is. Is. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.